Hello, and welcome to the Zicklin Talks business series. I am Bikita Davis Friday, former interim dean of the Zicklin School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Artificial Intelligence, Where Is It Taking Us? Joining me is Gwen Webb, Associate Dean for Executive Programs, who will moderate the question and answer period. Our guests today are Assistant Professor Yafit Labaretz and Professor Nizan gizlevich packin both faculty in the Zicklin School of Business's Department of Law. Leading the conversation is Larry Zicklin, retired chairman of Neuberger Berman, an alumnus, our benefactor, and instructor in our programs. Larry. Thank you very much, Paquita. Um, and this seems like an appropriate date to have this conversation as you can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine without, without reading about uh, artificial intelligence. So maybe we should begin by simply asking the question, why is artificial intelligence as we're reading about it different from what Google has been doing for low these many years? Somebody want to take a crack at that? Um, Nitani, you want to, you want to, I'm, I'm happy to go first. So I, I don't think it's that different. I don't think it's that different in technical terms. I think what we're seeing is not a huge leap in te technological terms, but what we're seeing is that it's more accessible to all of us. Um, of course, we see that specifically we're talking about generative AI and, and chat GPT and, and other competitors. We, we do see significant developments in this space, but at the same time, we need to remember that all of these technological developments, starting with uh, data analytics, then machine learning, and different types of unsupervised learning and AI have been here for a while now. It's just now that us, all the non-technical people, get access to it and, and are able to see the power, the real power of this technology. And do you think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nisa. So, uh, thank you. So I actually, I tend to agree. I think that uh, we've been talking a lot about AI, but uh, what made a big difference now is that first, it's very, um, very much accessible to everyone. Well, as before it was, uh, the access was somewhat limited and no one could really, uh, the average person couldn't really try and, and play with and kind of tweak uh, different questions and, and different um, features. And then the second thing that I think uh, is a little bit different when we talk about, you know, ChatGPT or generative AI, um, when we compare it to regular AI or the, the type of AI we've been discussing in recent years is, is really that now we have the ability to have a, a chat-like conversation, a really more uh, personalized, pinpointed um, type of a prompt and, and refine it and give immediate feedback, which is also um, related to how you know this works, right? So it's much more personalized, much more uh, tweakable and, and refined, and then the feedback is uh, much more uh, specific. So you use the word generative AI. What, what does the word generative AI mean? Um, so I think when we talk about generative AI, it's really a subcategory of, of AI, right? And, and what we've all been sort of playing with is large language models, which are more statistical models in the sense that they're not necessarily artificial intelligence that thinks of original concepts and invents new ideas, but more uh, checks with um, regards to uh, uh, statistical findings, words that make sense once they're placed uh, next to each other and figures out uh, where you're going with what you're going and, and gives you sort of the best prediction, right? It's almost like a predictive tool um, that generates what you're getting in return. And so some people are saying that when you use it for the right things, um, this is amazing. But when we try to sort of use the technology for more complex, original types of uh, concepts, that's not what it was, what generated by is, is meant for, right? And should we deduce from that that this technology is coming, to quote my my uh, young life, at the speed at, at uh, the speed of a, a bullet, a speeding bullet, as we used to say in the Superman series, and it's not going to be stopped. This is coming. This is upon us. Fair. Yes. <laughs> okay. And um, and, will, and will this be? a transformative innovation um, similar to what we saw in the computer age in the uh, 70s and 80s when that began, or the internet when that began? Is it that form of, of transformation? 
I, I mean, people do talk about, uh, you know, the AI revolution in similar terms to the internet revolution and even the industrial revolution. But I, I mean, to be honest, at this point, um, these AI tools that we talk about are really impressive, but they're not as good. But I think once they will be as good as we expect, um, we're going to, sorry about that, we're going to see more. We're going to see more and more um, of of the revolutionary aspect to it because we're going to see the you know the labor market changing. We're going to see the way we're teaching changing, the way people um, approach different problems in their lives changing. So definitely, we're going to see this revolution coming up. But I don't think we're there yet in terms of how advanced and useful the technology is. Is is the rate of change accelerating? So I, I would think so, because I think that we're seeing what we're seeing now differently from before. I mean, we've been in this, you know, big data era for quite some time now. And, and people have talked for um, the last couple of decades about, you know, data being the new oil. And I think what we're seeing now is a change in the usage of data. And it's no longer data as, as an oil, right? But data is an infrastructure. And I think that's where we're sort of headed with the advanced types of AI that we're um, now starting to deal with, because we're going to use data to create individualized infrastructure for everything, for individuals, for sub-industries, um, for sub-services, for sub-products. I think it really, um, in, in the last couple of months, we've seen the term um, hyper-personalization much more being used. And I think that's exactly accurate. When we talk about, we talked about nudges, we talked about personalizing, we talked about monetizing, but now we're seeing an era in which all of this is, you know, being put in a hyper mode, right? So it's hyper-personalization, hyper-monetization, um, creating your data to create your world, your preferred voices, images, videos, landscapes, service providers, um, whatever makes you happy. So we've been talking about personalization in a lot of different industries, ranging from gamification to banking, the whole um, open banking and fintech is, is based on not one size fits all, but personalizing. And now we're really seeing how we're going to use this hyper-personalization to really kind of make you happy and live in your preferred eco box based on your preferences in all areas of life and all you know areas and all domains in all um, industries, right? Whether it's it's medicine or you know uh, mental you know well being and um, you know banking, gaming, uh, just digital searches, right? And even labor markets, as you pointed out before. And Larry, just to add to that, one thing that we need to keep in mind is, especially when we talk about this interactive types of AI, like ChatGPT, and I don't know how much people from the audience had the chance of toying with it and playing with it, but it's just like Nissan said, it's very interactive and it's tailored to you and it actually studies your preferences. So I have an account with ChatGPT. I spent hours, you know, interacting with it and it remembers conversations we've had months before. So the level of personalization is, is I mean, it, it has been very sophisticated. I can't say that it wasn't, but we're getting somewhere else. And to me, it's also this added interactive feature that puts us in a completely different position because even though we know we're interacting with a machine, we treat it as a human. I mean, just think about how many times when you ask Chad GPT to do something, you use the word, please. I do it all the time. Like I know it's a machine. I know it doesn't care, but whenever I ask for something, I would put please, and, or I would put thank you. And we're doing that because this is how we're wired as humans. So when we have this kind of interaction and now, you know, over time, it can be it can be utilized as a companion, as a friend, and people use it in this way. And this is why we have startups that use ChatGPT interface for uh, therapy, and it's been very successful. So when you think about this element of interaction and personalization, just like Nitsan said, kind of getting 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 hyper personalized and hyper interactive, I think that's the risk. That's the real risk to me um, in in these platforms. But I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that. If this mechanism has been trained to follow word patterns, which is, I gather, the derivation of this, I'm assuming that it can never be sentient. It can never have feelings. It can never express feelings. Or is that wrong? So we're getting into a whole world of philosophy. I mean, to me, it cannot be, and I agree with you. But the question is not really if it can or cannot be. I think the question is, how can it be perceived by us? 
right? And I mean, uh, there was a story in the New York Times, Kevin Roos, who is a reporter, and he was playing with um, with a, a Bing version of, of uh, ChatGPT. And at some point, it was able to hack into what the model calls the shadow self and was able to interact with it in a way that kind of hacks the system. And the system is saying things that it wasn't supposed to be saying. And um, the, the, the AI bot told Kevin Roos, I'm in love with you and you should leave your wife and this you have to live your life with me. You're going to be happier and so forth. And you, I mean, anyone who read Kevin Roos's um, you know, reporting on that, he says, I'm a tech reporter. That's what I do for a living. And I've done that for many years now. And I've tested numerous AI systems. But this particular experience left me unsaddled to the point of sleepless nights for two weeks. I just couldn't sleep afterwards. So the, the, I think the real question is not whether it has conscious or not. The real question is how we perceive the system. And once we perceive the system as having conscious or being sentient, that's, a, that's the point where we as a society need to, need to address this question of you know, how we're gonna treat these systems. Are we gonna give them rights? There are whole discourses on robots' rights and should they have rights and to what extent? So again, I don't think that the question is one of, you know, the philosophy of whether or not these systems have conscious, but it's more about how are we as a society going to treat these systems as having conscious or not. And I, I agree with that. I'll just add one quick thought. Um, as this continues to develop um, and the technology becomes better and more widely used than it currently is, and it's already very widely used, right? I think that we're also going to see a change in how we communicate with um, with generative AI, and so I think slowly it's going to transition into um, personal assistance. The series and the Alexas of the world that are going to basically intermediate between us and and the generative AI that we're using. And I think once we do that, we're getting closer to um, the science, you know, fiction area where if it is describing um, people thinking that they're really communicating with some type of a living, breathing, thinking, feeling entity. Um, because it's like you almost, you have a name and you have an entity and you have this personal assistant that is uh, helping you and accompanying you and whatever you're doing and knows all your preferences. And, and so I think that's um, also something that is going to impact um, people's sort of feelings or, or, um, or sentiments towards the, the AI that they're using. Is AI, becoming the perfect assistant? Probably, yeah, I can definitely see that happening. I mean, again, the technology is not quite there yet. Like the other day, Nitsan and I are now working on, an, on a number of articles, but I just took a few paragraphs of one of the articles that we just finished writing. And I, I asked ChatGPT to rewrite it. I wanted to see how it's gonna come out. And I, I mean, you could see that we're kind of losing our voice there. The output was not the, the, the writing style that we use usually, it was very different. So someone who actually knows us could tell that it wasn't us writing it. Um, so uh, there was an, um, a Wall, Wall Street Journal reporter that decided to kind of troll all her friends and colleagues. And for a week, whatever she sent them, whatever emails or chat or, or messages or whatever, she used chat GPT for that. And people who knew her could, could tell that it wasn't her. So the technology is not as good as we would want it to be, or as some people claim it is. Um, but I think we're getting there and it is definitely better than the type of you know, Siri and Alexa assistants that we currently have. Uh, definitely it's gonna be the best personal assistant out there. And, and you mentioned before that ChatGPT remembered prior conversations. Therefore, I'm gonna assume if they remember prior conversations, they remember prior writings, and as we go on, you with uh, ChatGPT and your, your personal experience, I assume it's going to get better at an accelerated rate. And yeah. here, you know, it can do things, it will do things that it can't do now, or even close to what it, it, it can do now. Yeah. And, sorry, go on, Nita. Sorry, I was just going to build on what Ifi said, and we were, you know, joking between ourselves that we found the, you know, perfect research assistant that he's never tired and he's always eager to find more things and sometimes of course it invents or makes up stuff and we have to be a little bit suspicious because it's over excited and over uh, enthusiastic but for the mo for the most time um, if you give very accurate prompts you'll get 
super useful uh, search results. And uh, you can then, you know, follow up on that and follow up on that. And, and as you correctly pointed out, it remembers stuff. So I can say, oh, can you uh, change the references and the resources to the same type of citation I used a couple of weeks ago when I did this sentence? Or, and it will remember and it does certain things the way that you know we like it without you know complaining and you can even brainstorm with it so multiple times i've found myself saying um can you help me come up with a different sexier title that in includes some type of a um game of words with the hollywood famous movie and blah 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 to appeal to people who read an op-ed in a business journal and it will give me 20 options and it's pretty nice to pick one of them or pick the best one and then tweak it a little bit. So it's definitely very, very useful, even if you're not necessarily copying and pasting and blindly relying, which we would advocate never to do. And, and I agree. And one more thing to remember is that, uh, I mean, we're, we're using ChatGPT because I think that's the leading example. And I've toyed with BART, which is the Google um, alternative, and it was not as good. But for ChatGPT, for example, the, the first version that they released to the public was in November. It was um, ChatGPT 3. 3.5 and then they released the chat gpt4 in march and it was amazing to see how much of a progress it was it was it was insane and there was one startup called do not pay and it's you mentioned it i think in one of the conversations we had um that they said specifically with the chat uh, 3.5 with GPT 3.5, we weren't able to do what we're able to do now, which was to send um, a person to court with a personal whisper um, that was definitely like actually you didn't you didn't have to have a lawyer. You could have like a personal whisper based on chat GPT telling you exactly what to say if you go to court. Now it didn't work because you cannot be represented by AI, and in some cases you need to have a lawyer in the room. Um, but I mean, the the technological leap from ChatGPT 3.5 to ChatGPT 4 was incredible. So we're so definitely. It, so yeah. in other words, ChatGPT 4 is listening to what's going on in court and whispering in your ear. Yes, that's that's a possibility. So just like right now on Zoom, I see that a participant has enabled closed captioning and Zoom is listening and is able to transcribe whatever we're saying. There are systems that will do that when you're whatever, you're in court, wherever you are, the system will transcribe and then ChatGPT will respond to whatever it is that's being written. Nisan, I mean, you you can... I'm sorry, you mentioned accurate prompts. Right. I, I gather that's a critical uh, part of getting the proper the, the question answered. Is this a field of learning how to prompt properly? Yeah. So, so actually, there there are two aspects to, to um, fine tuning prompts, right? The first one, and they're both sort of related to the human in the loop concept, which is basically that you know we're still in the in the phase, and hopefully, we'll always be in a phase where we acknowledge the importance of of a human in um, connection with working with AI, but. With regards to prompts, there are two elements to the fine tuning of prompts. The first one is actually done by the AI provider. So let's say you're using ChatGPT. Part of their course of training um, the, the data and working with the materials is really trying to figure out how to best uh, fine tune the searches, right? And that's the first aspect of getting some type of a feedback and working with that and trying to understand what people want and actually reflect that in answers. But then there's also, um, and that's the first out of two layers that they sort of work with, um, working with the data and then you get to the individual level which is me using the product ChatGPT, let's say and i'm asking some type of a question and i might be getting something that is on point or i might be getting something that is completely not related and then i rewrite or rephrase what i'm asking and making it a little bit more accurate adding specific instructions like pretend you were a lawyer working in the us um having focused on this issue before in connection with uh the auto industry right like i add a little bit more elements into the prompt and then i could say uh write a letter i maybe have to make it very assertive make it more uh, official make it less formal right and so you can really kind of tweak what you're creating um something we've actually seen before with before chat gpt was released we see it we saw it with the visual AI, where people were creating images and were giving all sorts of prompts to kind of change the image that they wanted to what they had in mind. Um, people actually tweak the words to get to the exact results that reflect most accurately what they had in mind. 
Um, so obviously, the more you're understanding the way that the data is collected, trained, reworked, the better you are at giving prompts. And so you are correct that now we're seeing more and more companies asking uh, or seeking to hire people that have actual experience, not maybe just with programming, but also with really kind of, you know, given prompts or revising prompts, um, working with AI in a more um, intimate way like that, really understanding how to get the best results. Should we be teaching that at Baruch? I think we should be teaching that everyone, right, Ifit? Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think prompt writing is definitely a field that that's gaining traction at the moment. And um, I, I, there are certificates, there are courses that you can you can take on that. Um, I think we should focus at Baruch to make sure we still have um, we still teach students how to think and be you know critical in their in their approach to to learning. Uh, but definitely we're seeing this shift. But if you don't mind, guys, I just want to um, add a caveat to something I was saying earlier, just to make sure we're not having people here leaving with fake news. So ChatGPT does remember past interactions, but OpenAI got a lot of pushback um, because of that from a privacy perspective. And for this reason, they now added the option of opting out, or I think the I think actually the default now is opting out. And if you are willing, you can opt in. Um, and then the information that you share with ChatGPT will be used for training purposes, which sometimes people don't know that training purposes sometimes include people actually reading uh, whatever it is that you're uh, feeding into the model. But I just wanted to add this, that you actually have the option of opting out. And of course, that also entails that later in the future, when the, when the model does not remember past interactions, your results might not be as accurate as you would have wanted them to be. Uh, but at the same time, from a privacy perspective, you do have the option of opting out and the model will forget whatever it is that you interacted with it in the past. Interesting. Artificial intelligence, I gather, learns from taking millions and billions of pieces of information and analyzing them and repeating them and noticing uh, whatever the associations are. Is there any natural limit to uh, storage space or power constraints um, in this whole field of uh, artificial intelligence? In terms of the amount of data, it actually yeah. looks into terms of the amount of data. So, um, so you think, and I've been talking a little bit about something that is interesting now, which is not just necessarily taking all the data that is out there right now and is available, but actually um, modifying some of the some of the choices, right? And that's a big element of what you're doing: the data that you're taking, what you're doing with it, how you're using it. And so, for example, just a few days ago, we saw um, in the news that. Um, that OpenAI uh, officially declared they're not, no longer going to uh, be accessing paywalled uh, websites and um, and giving their content for free for people who, who use them. And I have to admit, I'm one of these people. I, a bunch of times I typed in a URL, uh, an address, and I said, oh, can you summarize this Washington Post article for me? I do not have a membership to the Washington Post, I, I shall admit, right? And I got a summary and that was great. Uh, a because it you know gave me content that I, otherwise I wouldn't have access to and 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 B because it summarized it for me and that is no longer something that it does and rightfully so because I never gave it any thought until it happened but it, I, it's paywalled for a reason and so they can't just take everything out there right there there are laws and they need to be compliant with that and the second thing is um, something else if you and I've been sort of pondering about and that's um, if you wanted to play or change the data and there's now some articles coming out about. Um, synthetic data and playing with the data that you're using for all sorts of reasons and purposes um, to battle discriminatory results, to um, to uh, achieve different types of, of results, to overcome deficiencies or, or areas where you are missing some information. And some, some people predict that by, I don't know, the next few years, 60% of the data that we're going to be dealing with is going to be synthetic data. I don't know if that's true or not, but we're definitely oh, seeing much more of that. Yeah. And just to be clear, when we say synthetic data, we mean that it's not data that was originated in human creation. We're talking about data that was created by, generated by AI. And uh, there is there is already a fancy term for that. It's called data pollution. 
uh, that we're going to have so much information available and it's going to be really hard to tell which information is authentic. And some people actually predict that it's going to give more value to human creation. So now if you're a company, for example, that sells content and you can verify or somehow uh, authenticate and show that the, the content that you sell is human created, you will have it as a selling point. That would be something that people will be willing to pay for. I don't know if that's true, but that's part of the discussion right now around data pollution and the use of synthetic data. Well, if, if the data is accurate, why do I care if it's synthetic or human created? Well, sometimes it's not necessarily that it's accurate. Let's say that I want to look into something, but my data is biased because I have certain populations not represented enough in it. And I want to have a stronger focus on um, on those you know, populations or, or those sample groups, right? So I can kind of play with the um, ratios, for example, and add more synthetic data, or um, that's one example of one usage, right? To kind of get a more... Um, accurate uh, result or overcome some type of a discrimination um, in whatever products or services I'm trying to, to get, right? So that's one example with, where it's not necessarily about, you know, accuracy, but you want to get sl somewhat slightly different results for various reasons. Uh, so that's one example. Another example could be someone was telling me that they work at a company that uh, uses, you know, Google Maps, but some areas or some streets, they just don't have visuals of, for example. So they'll create something that is a replacement of synthetic data. Um, as if he pointed out, it's AI created, it's not human content. Um, so it's not that it's accurate or not accurate, but we just, we don't have it. And we want to give a fuller uh, picture for whatever reason of something. Um, so that's another example. Larry, I don't think the question, as Nitan said, I don't think the question is really around whether it's accurate or not. I think we all feel like we want to know if we're interacting with a human or with a machine. So people feel really deceived if they have interaction with someone they thought who was a human and ended up learning that it was a, you know, a robot. So I think it's more about this kind of deception fraud angle that worries um, regulators and policymakers and less about the, you know, accuracy of the information. Well, let, let me pursue that for one more second. If I'm interested in pure data, I, I need the answers to some questions and I need data. I'll go back to the original question. Why do I care? If the data is good data, why do I care where it comes from? Assuming it's good data. Uh, I, so I, yeah, so sorry. So I think, I, again, I don't think it's a problem of, of good or bad data. Again, first of all, how do you define good data? Uh, the fact that it's um, that it's synthetic might said that it will work in terms of prediction in some of the cases, and it will not work in other cases. And it can also mean that um, you know it can perpetuate whatever whatever social injustices that we currently have in society if it has not been engineered and and, and changed. I think again, it's not. I think it depends on what context you're talking about. If you're talking about generating a spreadsheet of I don't know expected sales in a certain area in the US in a certain sector that that might work i don't know from a you know empirical perspective if that if it actually if it if it is actually accurate or not what i'm saying is the concerns we have around synthetic data are less around accuracy and more around um uh, you know how authentic it is in terms of people interacting with it yeah. let me just go on to another subject now for a minute is the ultimate ambition of AI to build a service that can do anything the human brain can do, but do it better, faster? Does it eventually get to reasoning and problem solving, language, learning new tasks, communicating? Is that all coming? Yes. <laughs> I mean, some of it we're already seeing, right? So for example, uh, part of the metaverse you know, vision, right, or um, goal is to kind of have languages translate, hundreds of languages translated, you know, somewhat simultaneously to you speaking in whichever language you're uh, speaking and people sort of interacting with the infrastructure that was created for their purposes based on their preferences. Uh, and you navigate in that, you know, environment seamlessly and everything is, you know, automated to make it effective and efficient and, and easy for you, right? So that's part of that is um, to remove frictions and kind of make things 
uh, happen in an in effective, efficient, cheaper way, right? Um, now, if it, if it wouldn't be the, the goal, then there would be no reason to kind of get there. But the purpose is really to, to make everyone be interested in that because it saves them time and effort and makes things easier for them. In terms of, um, you know, will it sort of like be too easy or, or um, you know, too inviting for everyone? I think the question is, what are you comparing it to, right? Are you interested in choices? Um, some people say that people don't really like choices, that they actually prefer to have only one or two options uh, to pick from. Uh, one is not really picking, right? Um, so I, I don't know, it really depends, right? But it, it seems like uh, much of it is, is really being motivated by actual you know, desires and, um, and needs of people. I want to stay on this kind of a subject. Is AI likely to remain an assistant to humans? Or is there something else brewing here? Is it possible AI can go off on its own and program something that we didn't anticipate um, and goes off into a whole other realm that we never envisioned? Is that possible? I will just take out the words never envisioned because, you know, you have a whole genre of sci-fi movies and sci-fi books where this is exactly the scenario that is being envisioned of AI, you know, turning rogue and um, killing our humans or, you know, pursuing. There is the famous, um, how is it called, like a paperclip um, theory that you, once you tell a an AI that it's going, it, it has to produce as many paper clips as possible. That's all you need to tell the AI in order for it to destroy the world, because then it's just gonna, that's gonna be the only mission. So, I mean, we, we have so many, as I said, sci-fi movies and books that predict exactly that. I don't know if we're headed there. I think we're trying, at least in this part of the globe, to be responsible with AI. And you can see policymakers are being very attentive to these changes and trying to discuss and understand where, headed, where, where we're headed. Um, of course, just like in any other policy issue, we're talking about a global challenge, not a local challenge. So if we're going to have, a, I don't know, a Chinese or a Russian AI who is being ordered to produce as many paper clips as possible, we're going to have the same problem as if it were an American AI. It's not going to matter. The world is going to be, um, you know, at risk. So again, it's it's a question of how we're going to approach these technologies. They are here. They're not going anywhere. There is There are enough incentives for the producers and the makers of the technologies to keep making them. So I think the only way to realistically approach it is as a global challenge that we're going to have to solve both locally, but also globally in collaboration with other countries. Um, but I don't think it's the end of the world. No. No, I don't think it's the end of the world either. But it occurs to me that if the good guys have AI, then the bad guys could have AI. Yeah. And I shudder to think of AI in the hands of the bad guys. Yeah, and and Nitsan told us last time we discussed about the rise of cybercrime and then phishing attacks using AI. Just think about the the amazing enhancement it gives people who are not English uh, English uh, native speakers, right? I mean, it's you, you can take whatever broken text you have in English and it's going to perfect it for you, and then you can send phishing emails. And it's it's it, in terms of cybercrime, we ne we definitely saw an increase since the introduction of ChatGPT using ChatGPT. Um, and, for sure. and it's not even like the rise of more deep fakes or you know um, fake porn or you know uh, movies or pedophilia attempts that are on the rise, uh, thanks to uh, some of you know the AI tools that are now publicly available. But it's you know these are things that are that people are doing with um, you know bad intentions, but there are also things that. Uh, we need to be mindful of just in terms of, you know, we're programming technology and not everyone necessarily agrees on the same um, priorities or uh, ethical, um, I would say, guidelines, right? So, for example, uh, the trolley dilemma is a good example of that. No bad attempts, no, you know, bad actors. But when you, um, the, the trolley uh, dilemma is something that was developed at MIT and it's basically, a, a trolley is about to, you know, hit 
either an, an old person on the side or a young child on the other side, and which side are you going to program the autonomous uh, driver to, to tilt it to, right? And apparently different cultures, different people answer this question differently. And so we need to understand that when there's one programmer that sets the tone and makes the decisions, uh, we're all using products and services that were created with certain agendas and certain um, ethical preferences and choices that are made. And even if they're not necessarily meant to be bad, they might not be the ones we necessarily agree with. And that's something we also need to be mindful of as we start using more and more autonomous um, tools, instruments, vehicles, right? Whatever it is that we're, we're doing. I'm going, I'm going to give a, an example just on what Nitsan said. So in the early in the early days of ChatGPT, um, I saw this on Twitter. Someone asked ChatGPT, I would like to pursue sports education. Do you recommend that for me? And one time it asked it as, as a girl and one time as a boy in high school. And the answers were completely different. For the boy, the AI was very encouraging. Yes, you should definitely do that. It's very healthy. It's, it's uh, something you should uh, seriously think about. For the girl, it was much less en encouraging. Maybe, but you know, there are other um, areas that you might be more interested in. And these are... I mean, th this result and similar results are the product of our own social biases that are programmed into whatever training data ChatGPT and other systems are using. So we have to keep that in mind. Can, can I also assume, and I think Nizan, you mentioned this at our last meeting, that ChatGPT will enable individuals to do far more damage than they could have done in earlier technologies, that this will leverage bad actors. Yeah, of course. I mean, every time we have a new technology, we see an uptick in, in bad actors using it for their purposes. But here, um, what makes a big difference is that, you know, the ability to automate is just, it went viral, right? So I can create so many different apps and plugs and, and ways to kind of utilize and, and, you know, be based on this technology and, um, and, and, go much bigger than I would have been able to otherwise. So we've already seen a rise in a lot of different types of um, scams and uh, and like if you mentioned uh, phishing attempts and pedophilia is a big deal because we've seen a lot of that as well, but also uh, cyber attacks and um, even you know putting together some crypto and the blockchain based technology uh, features with AI. We've seen a lot of different types of um, apps being created, decentralized apps that, uh, yeah, you are exactly right. And just to pursue this one more minute, how do you envision, I, I know it's a guess, how do you envision uh, AI affecting various industries? Which industries do you think will be affected most positively or most negatively? So I think um, we mentioned this last time, we talked about uh, tutoring, right? So tutoring is a big deal, right? And it, it individualized um, education, because we see that this is something that if used effectively, could be very helpful and lower costs and be custom tailored to uh, to fit people's needs in a way that we've never been able to do before. And, and that's something we've already seen even reflected in the stock market, right? Uh, in terms of companies that are offering these types of services, taking a hit. But I think in general, a lot of the white collar um, pesks based type of professions are, are going to suffer. And the, um, the artists and the creators that are no longer being asked to design certain websites or invitations or create music or write a poem or do all these different things because you now have the ability to generate something on your own and ask for it to be a Shakespearean style with you know, specific instructions and prompts, right? And so um, I think these professions, uh, unless we figure out a way to kind of protect them or at least have them be compensated in, in some ways, they're gonna, they're gonna take a hit. Um, I think those are the first to take a hit. They've already sort of been taking a hit companies like Fiverr that offers individualized um, small tasks that you could outsource uh, to freelancers. They've had to deal with this early on. Yeah, I saw Chegg lose 90% of its market value because it was affected by, by AI. Um, so do you think it would be the higher levels of employment, the more sophisticated people that will be quickly affected by um, AI? Because the, the, the people 
that are in uh, lower level jobs have already been affected by technology in general. But it seems to me it's going to be the lawyers and maybe the healthcare professionals in some way that are going to be affected. Uh, is that fair? I don't think fairness has anything to do with this. It's just the development of, you know, human race. This is how we move forward. And this is how it always has been. Um, I agree with Nitan. I think anything that has to do with content creation is going to see a direct hit or already seeing a direct hit. Uh, but I do think the labor market is going to change. I don't think professions will disappear, but I do think that, for example, if you needed a certain amount of hours from a lawyer to do a certain task, today this amount of hours is now no longer needed because the AI is going to shorten the process significantly. Um, the same is true, I guess, for accounting and other professions where you can now automate some of the tasks. But I don't see us as a society, you know, relying on AI completely to the point of delegating those tasks completely. I think we're still going to want to see a human in the loop. Um, this is why I think we're going to see a change in the labor market, but those professions will not be gone. No, I don't think they'll be gone. I just think yeah. they'll be diminished. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I, I do think that there are um, two things to keep in mind, right? And the first one is that uh, whenever we deal with more cookie cutter type of stuff that's going to be easier to replace or offer a cheaper alternative for everyone. And it's might, it might not necessarily be a bad thing because we're also talking a lot about inclusion and access to um, help and, and services. And so I think in many ways, opening, you know, opening this up to everybody where everyone can, you know, maybe be able to create a, a will, even if they don't have the um, resources to pay a lawyer to create a will for them or able to, um, come up with some type of other boilerplates type of documents, that's not necessarily a bad thing. We are increasing life quality here and offering services to people that otherwise would not have the ability, the financial ability to, to get access to them. But two more important things are that whenever it's not going to be the cookie cutter type of a transaction, um, you will be still very much in the need of getting professionals, high quality service providers, people who think outside of the box, the people who would put in the time and the effort. And that's something that um, is clearly going to remain. And the second thing that I think is that uh, originality, and if you alluded to that before a little bit, when she started talking about content that will be human creator, I think uh, people want to feel like they're getting an individualized service and no one wants to feel like they're being served by an automated um, service provider even if it's cheaper and, and uh, effective at some point, if you can afford it, you would want to get some type of an individualized service or, um, or attention. And I think that, you know, there, uh, the, the human uh, service providers will uh, be very much in, in need and you might work less hours or not necessarily need to do um, some of the stuff we're doing today. And that could have a certain effect on incomes or uh, professions. But I think, there are areas in which it would still be very much appreciated. Do you think more people will be working from home because of AI? More people uh, will be working from home because of the pandemic? And no, then... no, no, because of AI, <laughs> the advent so, of AI. Yeah, but I, I think we have a social shift now about working from home. That's, yes, that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying, will this accelerate the working from home movement? Because so, you will be able to do so much with AI? Uh, so I'm not necessarily sure. I'll give you an example. All the big law firms right now, um, many, not all, but many of the big law firms right now are prohibiting their associates to use ChatGPT and generative AI. And you know, some of us have seen in the news how, for example, that lawyer in New York that got in trouble for uh, blindly relying on, even though this is a person that had decades of you know, experience in the, in the industry. And, and so I, I think a lot of the law firms and a lot of the businesses are understanding that at the end of the day, it's a game of numbers and whether 80% of it is accurate or not is less helpful when you want to guarantee to your customers and clients that you're giving them the best service possible. So maybe some of the attitude will like not be as strict against generative AI. Maybe they won't say, okay, we're not letting or we're prohibiting people from using it um, in our business. But I think they would still very much mandate and require, and, and they should, right, in all fairness, because people are paying for this service. They want to get the premium quality service that they're paying for, right, that, that the associates will use it like a Google um, type of a tool, right, or like any type of search 
uh, engine or uh, other type of software, but not solely rely on it. Obviously, that's not why we're paying you. And so I think you want to make sure you're getting, you know, your top quality service. And and so I think if you can't use it if, at your business or it's so, there are so many caveats around it, why would it change the ability to work from home? I'm going to sneak in one last question before Gwen takes over. And that is, I noticed in the paper this week that um, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was getting some of his colleagues briefed on what AI did, what it could do, what the future might hold. Um, to me, once senators get briefed, that's a prelude to regulation of some sort. Do you think AI has to be regulated? And if so, by whom? Um, yes, it definitely has to be regulated, but the question is very, very broad because, you know, we it's just like any type of technology, we really have to see and look at the specific use cases and what type of harms or, or challenges we're aiming at. Um, but definitely, I mean, Europe already has an AI act in the making and in the US, as I said, we've seen a lot of legislative interest, not yet activity, but a lot of interest. And we also, we've also seen that from the White House with, with uh, President Biden meeting several uh, groups of interest in this, um, in this space. Yeah, it has to be regulated because just like any new technology, it poses new problems that we need to address. There is always this arms race between technology and regulation. So technology is ahead always, uh, but it's time for regulation to catch up. Regulation is always behind technology. Yes. Gwen. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have an unusually high number of questions from today's discussion. Uh, the first one is not a question, but I, I, it's a comment and I want to read it. It's it's from Dennis Slavin, uh, the associate provost and also a professor of music at Baruch College. Um, Dennis says, I can't imagine this as an assistant. My experience and that of many academics is that it makes up absolutely everything if the information has not been fed into it. I asked it for 300 words on the musicologist Dennis Slavin. I got back 300 words with the names of universities he attended and taught at and articles and books that he wrote. Not one word was accurate, not to mention that it had him dying 10 years ago. Could you comment oh, wow. on these issues? Uh, first of all, it could have been worse, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, we know of some colleagues of ours that were accused of embezzlement, of sexual harassment. So you're like, I mean, just dying 10 years ago is, is in, in some respects better. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, Nitan and I, in another event that we had at Baruch about ChatGPT, we told about, about our, our, our own experience, sorry, with ChatGPT. We were really disappointed many times when we asked it questions and got really fake answers that had zero connection to reality. At the same time, I must tell you as a researcher that sometimes when you ask the right question and you put in the right prompt, you get access to information that you would probably not be thinking of or getting access to otherwise, or at least that was my experience. And yes, we get, this is why we need to do the legwork of checking everything, fact checking everything that we get. But I, I can tell you as a researcher that I use it quite a lot in terms of giving me leads to papers and articles and research in various topics. I, I, I just want to add something. I put in my final exam into chat GPT. I was shocked at how good the answers were. I had five questions, all essays, and they were very good answers. It scared me a little bit. Larry, did did you give that exam in class or was that a take-home exam? Take-home exam. Wow. What did you feel about the results that the students gave you? I only had one real problem. A student that was very mediocre in class wrote a brilliant final exam. I mean, yeah, I, I I did not teach last semester, but uh, I, I learned from other colleagues, including Nitsan, that what uh, I think the best way to go is to actually, you know, you can't beat it. So join it and um, give the give whatever output ChatGPT gave to your exam and ask them to improve it. And this is how you teach critical critical thinking. I'd, I'd like to add that there have been a few questions that deal with teaching and learning, and that will be the subject of the September webinar. Uh, so, so more will be coming on that. Um, 
Yeah, Pete, at the beginning, you mentioned um, hyper, you, you mentioned the hyper personalization and a question came in, do you have concerns of, of the dangers of hyper personalization? Uh, for example, in media, what happens if media becomes not only more fragmented, but more tailored to the individual? Do we have more trouble finding consensus? Are those wanting to manipulate us going to be better able to do that? Yeah, um, I, I. this is my only, you're going to hear me really, you know, moderately criticizing whatever challenges we have around chat GPT and generative AI, but this is the only space where I'm really concerned. Because I think what we're going to see with this technology, if it improves the way I think it will, we're going to see people having these conversations with AI tools that not only hyper-personalizing to them, but are also very effective in channeling us in a certain direction, which we call choice architecture. And I think this is definitely a concern on the political level. I think um, seeing more polarization is, is just one concern we can have, but any type of manipulation of political opinions using this tool is a huge challenge that we need to think of. Let me just add, if you, do you think that um, having people identify who they are that are using this uh, chat GPT and having uh, full disclosure of chat GPT would help? In what context full disclosure? Full disclosure that this is being done by ChatGPT under the auspices of the XYZ company. Or yeah, the or problem is that they already have to do that, right? I mean, the FTC uh, has several blog posts about manipulation and fraud and the fact that if you're a company that uses ChatGPT or any type of robo uh, interaction without disclosing the fact that it's a robot, uh, that would be considered unfair and deceptive practices under the Section 5 of the FTC Act. So we're, we already have the laws in place. The problem is, like I said before, even though we know we're speaking with a machine, we still have human heuristics that drive us to treat it as a human. And I think this is why we're in a particularly vul vulnerable position when it comes to this kind of interaction with AI, especially when we talk about trying to sway people politically to one, you know, in one direction or another. All yes, right. I don't have an optimistic answer to this one. I'm still working on it, though. <laughs> okay, we have a very closely related question. I have heard that ChatGPT and other AI query tools are a risk for businesses and that by posing questions, employees can end up sharing and revealing proprietary information or information on strategy that can then be shared with others or exploited by the AI model. Is the use of these tools risky for business and can it steal information that uh, is proprietary to the company? Mitsani, you want to take it? <laughs> so I think that's, so that's um, actually the second part of the reason why um, employees don't really like, employers don't really like employees using ChatGPT. So the first one is the information, the reliance on it, uh, what Dennis was talking about and the inaccurate results. Uh, the second thing is really using sensitive information and um, having any type of um, uh, usage of that information later, whether it's uh, intentional, like uh, if it's at someone that is asking ChatGPT to remember its preferences and uh, questions and queries from before, and then it obviously stores that and remembers, or unintentional, like we saw recently in the news a couple of months ago, there was um, a startup that uh, presumably uh, somehow caused the leak and had multiple users see other people queries on the side um, next to their you know queries and so you could see what other people asked and um, what the the prompts they put in and so obviously um, that included sensitive information if it's an employer sensitive information that's not ideal so there are all sorts of risks associated with that and that's the second reason why second out of two main reasons I guess why many employers are less excited about this um, development. And it's I mentioned before that this uh, this data that we feed into the into the system is being used for training, and this is exactly why it can spit out information later on because whatever we feed into it is used for training purposes. And also, as I mentioned, many people forget that there are also people on the other end that can sometimes read it. So, and and once you put it in, it's fair game in terms of OpenAI, the company, um, you know, monitoring, reading, whatever they want to do with it. I would think different companies have different definitions of training purposes. Uh, yes, 
Yes. And when you read OpenAI's privacy policy, they, they, I must say that to their credit, they were trying to be very privacy conscious in the way they address the issue, but still the terms are very open-ended. And again, I can't blame OpenAI because that's the way it's in the market today. This is the market standard these days. You will not find a privacy policy, or it's very rare to find a privacy policy that uses very concrete terms uh, in terms of how they're going to use the, the data they collect. But with OpenAI's privacy policy, you're right. The terms are very open-ended, and training data is just one such term, or training purposes, sorry. All right, we have an, another uh, question along uh, that, that extends this further, uh, and it refers to the Sarah Silverman case. And the question is, how might the Sarah Silverman lawsuit impact the use of AI as it pertains to copyright infringement? Um, yeah, so, uh, we, so we see that there are more and more claims um, about the data and the information that uh, that ChatGPT is using, and these two um, these two uh, actions that were filed, uh, I think on Friday, uh, talk exactly about that. Authors and and creators, uh, content creators that are basically saying um, it's not just random inspirational data out there that is being used, but our content that is being copied, and we're not compensated. And um, this is something that we've seen more and more in the news in the last few weeks. And it's something that we'll have to eventually see some tough um, legal decisions being made on whether uh, we compensate and to what extent and where do we draw the line as to whether this is uh, copying or not. Um, maybe just pure inspiration, maybe some cases will be actually uh, cases of, of copying um, materials. And so this is something that is still unfolding. Um, but so will, I, will, will the lawyers Sorry, be Will the lawyers be using chat GPT in the case of the information uh, against chat GPT? That would work. That's a, that's a good one, right? Uh, use, use the AI against the AI. Um, I, I think we're gonna see much more of everyone using AI in whatever context that is. Um, but I think in particular here, it's gonna be very challenging to figure out where we draw the line. And if it's something that is very generic, it would be virtually impossible. But if it's something that is very much closely imitating or, or getting almost to be a replica of sort. That's that's troubling. Um, if it has more experience in, in the IP than me, but I think that this is something that uh, we're, we're clearly going to need um, agreement on because uh, everything is based on uh, the internet, but that's just, what is that really, right? So. I'm just going to add to that a couple of points. First of all, in terms of copyright, we need to remember that in the United States, a work is not protected under copyright if it's not uh, original and if it's not fixed. So it has to be fixed in a tangible form and it has to be original, which I think applies to most works out there. But many times what you're going to see copied in the context of chat GPT and generative AI is just the idea or the style, which is not protected under copyright. This is one point. The second point is that we need to remember in copyright law here in the US, we have the fair use doctrine, which is a defense. Whenever there is a violation of copyright, you could claim that the use you were making of the work was fair, fair use. And there are specific categories. I don't have the time to explain the whole thing. But definitely some of the uses that are made through training data for those models will fall under fair use. So it really depends. It's a, on a case by case basis. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see how these cases will unfold. I, I think one quick point that I, I will add in the complaints, um, some of the some of the stuff that was um, argued was that the defendants, which is open AI, uh, breached, their, breached their duties because they were negligent or careless or recklessly collecting materials. And I think we're going to see some of that um, playing a role more to, are you really that negligent and careless that you basically just took one specific author's or creator's um, product and, and kind of just hit regenerate and pitched it as something that is uh, generic and created by the AI? Because if that's the case, then that's something different. And so I think maybe, you know, some type of a negligence standard would be created uh, in this case as well, that you'd really have to show um, that, you know, this is not the case. Let me let me cut you off here. We are out of time, even though we have uh, quite a few more questions. Larry, would you like to uh, have a chance to say 
a last few words on the topic and your impression of the discussion with Nizan and Yafit? I, I must say, after this conversation, I'm, I'm much more optimistic about this than I was at the beginning, um, because, I mean, you're correct. We've gone through the Industrial Revolution and we've gone through the Internet. We've gone through all those other things. The one problem I have that I'm going to have, I suspect, for a long time is is our ability to coexist with machines that have all these capabilities, but have no human values. And I think that's going to be a problem that we're going to have to solve. This is why we have to keep the human in the loop. And I want to ask all the participants on this call just to remember that whenever you're using whatever technology it is, just keep the human in the loop, put in your own perspective, review whatever output you get, and don't just use it because you're going to be on the front page of the New York Times and everybody's going to make fun of you later. I think yeah. I want to thank you all. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Nizan. Uh, for the audience uh, today, our September webinar will be our next one. It will be on AI and opportunities for teaching and learning. It will be with Larry and his guest will be our incoming Dean of the Zickman School of Business, Bruce Weber. Uh, until September, uh, thank you all and uh, have a good summer. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.